Independence has never been easy. Nearly 250 years ago, it was something worth fighting for. The idea of a people who stood on equal footing, free to speak, free to wander, free to live. These were ideals worth risking everything for. Today, we find ourselves fighting old battles, not with past foes, but with ourselves. We are a nation divided, divided by skin, divided by opinion, divided by hate. It seems the very freedoms we once fought for have become stumbling blocks. Are we too busy seeking ourselves to even recognize the tragedy which surrounds us? Do we no longer see the profound need for the hand of God? In this moment, the truth of Scripture rings especially true. If we, the people, will humbly pray, turn from wickedness, and seek His face, then He will hear us. He will forgive us, and He will heal this land. Today, may we remember this one simple truth. True independence is found only in our dependence on God. It's always uh, awesome to be able to celebrate our independence, amen? Yeah. We are, we're proud to be Americans, but uh, in our celebration of independence, I think the video said it best, uh, we're driven back to an acknowledgement of our complete dependence on God. And I think that what should separate us from any other American is, uh, is an acknowledgement that, uh, you know, in God we trust is a whole lot more than, you know, uh, a phrase on our coin. It ought to really be uh, engraved on our hearts that, that really that, that trust in Him, that dependence in Him is what has led to the blessings that we've received over uh, the years. And here, here's the, the truth. The truth is that uh, without the grace of God, our country would be nothing. And so, just a reminder today, our, our core value, one of the seven core values of our church is dependence. And in that one word, we truly are saying we're completely dependent on God. And so, by reminding ourselves of that constantly, well, that's demonstrated in prayer. So, I think it'd be fitting just to kind of uh, go to the Lord together on Independence Day. It's kind of cool that uh, July 4th is a Sunday this year. And, uh, and we can just kind of at least have a, a moment where we just, we pray together and agree uh, uh, about our dependence on God together uh, as a people. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you and just thank you for an opportunity to live in a country where we can freely worship you. God, uh, we know that uh, we're not better people. Lord, we, we've just been blessed by a good God. And um, God, I just, I pray today we'd be reminded, even as we... Uh, potentially overindulge in some cookout food, most likely, all of us. I pray that we would also just be reminded of, of just how, how good you've been to us. Um, God, we don't deserve what you've given us. So, Lord, today as we celebrate independence, I pray we'd be driven back to our knees in complete dependence on you. That'd be our prayer. And bless your word as, as we look at it now. And I, I pray that much would be made of Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go and take your Bibles. Turn in, turn on your Bibles to the book of Philippians. The book of Philippians. And uh, I want you to remember this is week five. I know July 4th is kind of a day where uh, it's easy to kind of probably disconnect. This is not a message you want to disconnect uh, from. In fact, Probably it's a good day to have this kind of message because we're able to really, I, I hope, have a real, uh, a little bit of a, not casual in, in understanding that the content shouldn't be casual, 
But Cash was in, I want to just really share my heart from this passage. I'm going to give you the points, three points that are on the app. Then I'm going to back up and, and basically try my very best just to preach um, from the text and, and the, the idea of the message without being locked into my notes so much because I've gone long in all services up to this point, all right? And I want to get you out on time as best as I can. So with that in mind, I want to make sure we, we do that well. Um, in Philippians, we've, we started with this whole theme and idea of forward. And that being said, it was founded on this, this concept and idea of God starting something. You remember that in the very beginning, first week of the series? God who started something is going to finish it. He who began a good work in you is going to bring it to completion, right? So that was this idea. He's moving his work forward in your life. Well, today's message is all about that. It really is kind of a culmination of that that we started five weeks ago. And I know you've been blessed by uh, the preaching last couple weeks as Amy and I have been going on our uh, anniversary trip. Thank you for the opportunity to be gone. But, uh, but I have missed preaching, man. I'll tell you, that's probably why I'm going long. But, uh, but this, whole, this whole concept is, is so important because it's going to answer two major questions that a lot of people ask. Can't tell you how many times people come and ask questions like, um, hey, it, something centered around, uh, it, is my salvation based on works? Or at least, what does works have to do with salvation? And, and really, it's a connected uh, question to another question, and that basically is, can I lose my salvation? Or how do I know I'm saved? I mean, there's a lot of interrelated questions that are all centered around this idea. And before we even dive into the scripture, I want to kind of just lay some conceptual foundation to the idea of salvation that help us understand what we're building on today. The whole idea of salvation is Jesus, all right? So Christ Jesus died on the cross for us, and his work on the cross is what we have faith in. We trust in his work on the cross at salvation. And so when somebody has a confusion about, if I were to say, hey, why would God let you into heaven? If your answer starts with, because I'm a good person, or I would hope at the end of the day that I've done enough good stuff to outweigh the bad stuff. And you know, if we're watching at home or on the beach right now, you know, you might be thinking, okay, why is that a bad answer? Maybe that's kind of, you know, I, I, I'm just hoping I'm a religious person or, you know, I've always believed in God. That might be the way some people answer. That would not be a way that, that scripture would answer that question. See, salvation is not about your works. Salvation is not about how good you are. Salvation is not about how many good de deeds or checklists you filled out. It's not about a scale where you've done more good stuff than bad stuff. And so, check, you're in. That's not salvation. See, salvation is ultimately that you have trusted in the work of someone else. That's, that, is, that is the foundational part of salvation, is that when you come to faith in Jesus Christ, you say, I'm not trusting in my work anymore. I'm trusting in the work of Jesus and his work on the cross. He died for me, and so I'm placing my faith in him. That is the foundational concept and idea of, of Christianity. And so here's the deal. When somebody says, well, I don't, how do I know I'm saved? I mean, if my first question is, why do you think you're saved? And if it's about works, then look, if you think you're saved by works, then there's no wonder you're doubting your salvation because you're not perfect. And if you're saved by your works... By doing good things, then you'd be lost by doing bad things. And that's why some people, honestly, have been baptized 17 times. Y'all all right? <laughs> and that's why sometimes when people come to us and say, hey, I think I need to be baptized again, we don't try to talk people out of uh, true baptism after their conversion, obviously. That's an act of obedience. But we don't just believe you ought to go get dunked every time you had an emotional move uh, and the Holy Spirit moved in your heart and you're rededicating your life. That's not what baptism is. You see, ultimately, at the end of the day, salvation is about Jesus. And so if, if you have based your salvation on works, then listen, you do need to be saved and baptized because you're not saved. If you think you're saved because of how good you are or you think you're saved because you're part of First Baptist Church or if you think you're saved because you give a lot of money or what, none of that makes you saved. 
And there's no amount of good things that's gonna take you over the top. It's not gonna make you climb the ladder. And so we have to, at the end of the day, recognize our trust in the work Christ did is what saves us. And so those are kind of foundational concepts that lead us down this path of answering the question we're gonna answer from Philippians today. I wanna back up and just for a second talk about Philippians chapter one. And and if you remember verse six, it said, we quoted it a minute ago, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. So this was, this was the, the thematic verse, you could say, for the series, because it, it, the whole letter that Paul is writing is, is giving us this idea of God started something, and when God starts something, he finishes it. Well, here's the thing, he started a work of salvation in you. He started a work of salvation in you and he is working that work of salvation in you today and he will finish that work of salvation in you. Now this is speaking, when I say that of you, if you're a Christian, if you have trusted Jesus, if you have placed your faith in his work, then that's you. So we're gonna talk about that and again, I need you to lean in because this is not kindergarten Christianity, all right? I'm I'm gonna say that up front. This is definitely like maybe middle school Christianity, all right? This is a little deeper than than, uh, probably a lot of people even go. You need to get ready and and lean in. Uh, If you're with me, go and say, "Uh uh-huh. All right, I got at least three-fourths of you, all right? So so in chapter one, if you'll remember, look at verse uh, 27. Um, we, we have to remember that Paul's closing words in chapter one kind of begin to let us see there's gonna be this tension that we're gonna feel. He said, only let the manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side. This is a, a word of unity, by the way. Side by side for the faith of the gospel, not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction and your salvation. All of that is to the group of Christians at Philippi. This this letter is written to a group of Christians. It's important contextually in just a minute. But then notice, it's written as a clear sign to them of their destruction, your salvation, and that from God. So what's he saying? Salvation is from God. Verse 29, for it has been granted to you that for your sake, for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. So Paul begins this tension, he presents this tension that's 2,000 years old. This is not a new problem, all right? Not a new tension, but the tension he brings up is very simply explained uh, and very very challenged to, to get, uh, I guess, clarity on, and that is the sovereignty of God and the free will of man. You could say divine sovereignty, human responsibility, because even in this passage, he's talking about salvation being from God, but then there's expectations of individuals that definitely let us know that the expectation needs to be met by them based on choices they make. And so it's a tension here, and it's a a tension many people love to debate. We're not going to debate it at all. We're just going to look at a balanced view of Scripture and how these concepts are compatible. Sovereignty of God, free will of man. Last Sunday, we talked about chapter 2, verses 6 through 11, amazing masterpiece of Scripture that talks about having the mind of Christ and, uh, and I think it was Pat who preached and uh, talked about how we're to have the mind of Christ and, and ultimately because of Christ's obedience, even to the point of death, death on the cross, he's now been highly exalted, given a name above every name. It's amazing. I love that passage of scripture. It's so powerful. The passage before us today comes out of this illustration, all right? So last week's passage was really an illustration of obedience. This was a demonstration of Jesus Christ of what an obedient person to the Father is, what it looks like to to obey God the Father. And so it comes out of this illustration into chapter two, verse 12 and 13. And it's a presentation of these two paradoxical concepts that we just read about in chapter one. And so we see God's sovereignty and man's responsibility in these two verses. And I I hope if you're with me, you're gonna get it. All right, look at verse 12, Philippians 2, 12. Notice what it says. Therefore, my beloved, 
as you have always obeyed, so now not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation. Would you say those five words with me? Work out your own salvation. One more time. Work out your own salvation. All right. So he says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you. Go ahead and say those seven words. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Now, I don't know if you caught it, but verse 12 sounds completely different than verse 13. Because in verse 12, it says, work out your own salvation. But then in verse 13, it says, for it is God who works in you. So this is, in these two verses, this tension for 2,000 years that people wanted to argue about. You know, do we really have free choice? You know, is God so sovereign that we're basically just machines that, that just go through and everything's so predestined that really doesn't matter what I do. I mean, God's chosen me or he's not chosen me, therefore nothing I do matters. Well, I think looking at scripture makes that, that opinion completely bogus absolutely absurd. There's so much scripture that shows us that is not the case. Now, is God sovereign? 100%, yes. But has he in his sovereignty given us the ability to choose? Yes, absolutely. And so with all that in mind, even though that is very difficult and we see what seems to be somewhat of a uh, a paradox, I would call it a complementary paradox. This is a, this is a, a, a situation where two paradoxical concepts definitely come together, not as contradictions, but as a complementary, a complement to one another. And so three things real quickly we're going to talk about, all right? I'm going to go ahead and give you all three points, and then I'm going to preach until I'm out of time, all right? And if I run out of time, we'll just all say bless his heart, all right? Now here's number one, ready? Take responsibility, number one. If you have the app, go and type it in there. Take responsibility. Second, step or point is trust in God, take responsibility, trust in God, and then finally we will talk about living with purpose. You live with purpose. Those are the three points, the three steps, principles that we can find here in this passage. But verse 12 is the first one. As we see that part of this equation uh, is that we must take responsibility. There's no way that we can reason around that. The Christian faith is, is definitely all about God doing the work. So this is where it gets really difficult for us to grasp. But we can't, we can't push away or deny the personal responsibility that we have. Here's how we know it's personal responsibility at some degree. Because we know that if I were to die and go to hell, it would be because of sin in my life. I am personally responsible for my sin unless I trust Jesus as my savior. So personal responsibility is massive when we're talking about our faith. We're personally responsible. And even after we come to faith in Jesus Christ and now it's his righteousness that we have inside of us and so we're going to heaven, not hell, internally separated from a loving God, no, so what, even after we come to him, we're still personally responsible for some things because God has saved us and now we're responsible to live for him. And so here's the question. What is it to work out your own salvation? How is this all going to come together, Wayne? Because this is an awful lot of stuff. This is big ideas that we're trying to cram into 33 minutes. What does it mean to work out your own salvation? Let me say, first of all, what it does not mean. Paul is not saying that salvation is a product of your works. We've already kind of clarified and cleared that. The same person who wrote Philippians 2.12, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, is the same man who wrote Ephesians 2.8, for by grace you've been saved through faith, that not of yourself is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Same man. So we see the inspiration of the Spirit through the Apostle Paul is not trying to tell us somehow we have have to work for our salvation. But then we also see that Paul is not trying to create fear in you that would lead you to doubt. I'm praying that this frees some people up today. This, this message ought to bring confidence. There may be people again at home who have been debilitated by fear of losing their salvation. 
I talk with, I've talked with church leaders in our church even uh, in the last six years who, who struggle with this. So if you've struggled with doubt and if you've had fear of losing your salvation, am I really saved? How do I know that I'm really saved? Uh, those are great questions and we need clarity and we need confidence in that subject. And so don't run from that question. Don't run from that feeling. I know that, man, there, there are tons of people who want to talk to you about it, but I hope today will bring some clarity and confidence in that because look, it's not God's desire for you to be confused. We know that from 1 Corinthians 14, God is not a God of confusion, but peace. So he wants to bring peace to your confusion in the sense of your salvation and understanding of it. So if works can't save us, why does, does Paul say to work out your own salvation? Man, that sounds an awful lot, Wayne, like he's saying your works matter uh, when, when it comes to salvation. So let's first set our attention specifically on the words work out. <laughs> For me to even say work out makes me want to laugh, all right? But, uh, but, but work out, it's because I have not and I'm convicted in, in three weeks, all right? But, uh, but work out, what does work out mean? Notice Paul did not say work for. It would have been very different if Paul had said work for your salvation with fear and trembling. That's not what he said. He said work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Listen to this quote from Kenneth Wust. Uh, he said the English translation is good. He said this is a good way of wording it. It's a good translation. If one uses the words work out as one does when referring to the working out of a problem in mathematics. I thought that was a helpful quote. Helps us understand that work out is not saying work for. But this is saying like work it out. Like God's, God's saying you need to work out this equation with fear and trembling. Understand, I think there's some sense of like understanding your salvation, uh, growing in sanctification, we'll talk about in just a second. Um, all that's part of this responsibility that I've got to take in my salvation to grow in understanding and working it out. And, and not only just understanding it, but working it out in my sanctification in the work of loving Jesus and living for him uh, with all that I am. So, so don't forget Philippians 1, God began a good work and he will complete it. Best way I can talk about this is, is a, a repetitive thing that I've used an awful lot in six years, but it's very important. It's a foundational doctrinal concept, salvation. And it's three big words, uh, forgive me, but this is not really that, that crazy. But justification, sanctification, and glorification are three tenses of salvation. So in one massive sense, we definitely have been saved. And if somebody says, Wayne, do you believe once saved, always saved? Absolutely. Without question, I, I, I believe in eternal security. I believe if you have been saved, you, you are saved and you will always be saved. That's justified, all right? Usually, when we talk about salvation and we say, I'm saved, we're talking about that one tense of salvation. I have been saved, past tense. I've been justified by the work of Jesus on the cross, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and my faith in that work is why I've been justified. All past tense. There is nothing that can change my being justified. That is super important, all right? If you're gonna doubt your salvation, you're doubting the work of Jesus. If you've really been saved. I'm talking about if you really trusted the work of Jesus at salvation. For you to doubt salvation is for you to doubt Jesus. So I, I hope this like liberates some of us, all right? And lifts a burden off your shoulders. Look, if you're doubting your salvation because of you, you got a wrong view of salvation because your work isn't what saved you anyway. Are y'all all right today? I'm, I'm worried about you. Y'all act like it's July 4th or something. I don't know. Because look, I mean, who are you trusting? Are you trusting you or him, right? So you trusted him and justi he justified you. He saved you. Here's where today matters. We're being sanctified. Now, let me, understand, let me tell you, if you're not a believer, then I'm telling you all that you could experience, all right? I'm not trying to say everybody in here saved. If you've not placed your faith in Jesus, you're lost. But if you have been saved, you are justified, man. So, 
so you are now being sanctified. You are now in a current process of working out your salvation. Now, this is why it should help us, all right? We're in a process of of working the equation, (laughs) gaining understanding and growing in knowledge and love of Jesus who justified us. And this is so cool, and I'm gonna be repetitive in a minute. But at salvation, at justification, Jesus gave me his righteousness, all right? He put his righteousness in here. And so here's the reason a lot of people can't work out their salvation because his righteousness was never put in. So you can't work out what hadn't been put in. So if you haven't been justified, you can't be sanctified. And so here's a a very important problem to really do business with and confront yourself. The power of the Holy Spirit. If there's this like restriction, there's a blockage somehow in your life and you're not allowing the righteousness of God to to be worked out in your life, man, you you need to allow the Holy Spirit at very least to do some heart surgery and, and, and if you are a believer, he will free you up and you'll begin to grow in him. You'll begin to live for him. You'll begin to shine as lights. We'll see that in a minute. You'll begin to shine as lights in a dark world. Here's the problem. It may be that you've never been justified. It may be that you've not been saved. My goal is, again, not to bring fear or doubt to anybody. If you're saved, I believe this word will give you confidence. If you're really a believer, I believe this word will not make you confused or afraid about your salvation. Because if you've been saved, if you've been justified, you are saved. You just need to free it up and allow the righteousness of Jesus to flow out of you and start working out, all right? Because that's really what uh, Paul is trying to teach us here in context. So, so let me back up just a little bit. So this is, this is not an individual challenge primarily. I think this is an important context too to recognize. This is, this is a sermon or it's really a, a letter that Paul is, is writing to a group of Christians. If we read verses 12 and 13 and look at them exclusively and apply them exclusively just to you and me individually, then we've missed the larger context because even the Greek language, I don't know, sometimes people say Greek language, people immediately go to sleep. But in the Greek language, it's so important. It's all plural words. So the, the Greek is all plural here. Here's what that means. Paul's talking to a group. So he's saying, y'all, if he was from Georgia, amen, you know, y'all work out y'all's salvation, right? Work out y'all's salvation, your, your deliverance, another translation of the word, with fear and trembling. You need to work out, your, y'all need to work out your sanctification in fear and trembling. This is a very important point because it's not specifically at least primarily, specifically saying to me individually, Wayne, you better be afraid. You better be afraid. That's not the context of the scripture. Scripture's not trying to bring fear to us, trying to bring confidence to us to live our faith out loud for Jesus and to stop acting like lost people. That's what Paul really is trying to say. In in the most elementary of ways, one can only work out what's already inside. And so that's the biggest question for us to pose to ourselves today. Is Jesus inside? Have I been saved, really? If I've really been saved, then it should not be very difficult for us to come to the point of realization, the Holy Spirit conviction, that we need to let him shine through us. That we're failing at allowing the the righteousness of God to be worked out in our lives through a sanctifying work of Jesus because we're to follow his example. Listen to 1 Peter 2, verse 21. For to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. So again, here's that tension. God saved us, but it is our responsibility to follow Jesus. We have a choice to follow or to reject him, to repent and follow him or reject him and go the other direction. So we must take responsibility. Secondly though, and this is really what our responsibility is based on and founded on, and that is our trust in God. We must trust in God. Verse 13 makes it real clear, for it is God who works in you. 
It is God who works in you. There's never been a good thing you've done that God has not given you the ability to do and has not really done through you. So it is God who works in you both to will and to work his good pleasure. So we know we've talked about justification, sanctification, glorification, but it's so important to bring the distinction of those tenses, if you will, to light because at salvation, we, we ultimately were saved by God, but we're constantly in a process as we trust him being saved, we're being redeemed in a sense of the sanctifying work of Jesus. Quite literally, our learning to work out his righteousness is a daily process, and I'm still learning it. I mean, you're still learning it. None of us have arrived. This is what the apostle Paul himself said. And so how can we know contextually what Paul is speaking of related to God's good pleasure? When it says, when it says there uh, that both to his will and to work for his good pleasure, what is it for us to allow his good pleasure to take place in our lives? Let's look at verse 14. Do all things without grumbling or questioning, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. See? Holding fast to the word of life, so that in a day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of faith, I'm glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Here's the fact. The fact of the matter is to put it very plainly that, that when we've been justified by God and we're actually allowing the righteousness of Jesus that's been placed inside of our heart to be worked out in our life in sanctification, then that means we're gonna be shining like lights in the world. We're gonna be shining light in the place of darkness. People are going to know that we love Jesus and it's gonna be demonstrated by our love for them. How do you get that, Wayne? Look back at the illustration at the beginning of chapter two. Literally gave Jesus as a demonstration of what it meant to be obedient to God. He literally was obedient at the point of death, even the death of the cross, right? And so we see Jesus as the example and we wanna, we wanna actually be so self-centered. We say this often, we've self-centered the gospel to such a degree that we kind of think now everything revolves around us. And this is why we have uh, first, second, third, fourth Baptist churches in every town. I mean, why is that? It's, it's ultimately because people, not just Baptists, Christians can't even get along. And Paul knew this. It wasn't, this is not a new problem. I mean, if, if you Google Southern Baptist Convention, I shouldn't have said that, please don't do it, all right? But if you Google Southern Baptist Convention, all you're gonna see is a big dog fight right now. Why is that? Because pastors hadn't figured it out either. I mean, Paul's legitimately eating our lunch. The inspiration of the Holy Spirit literally saying, if you've been justified, act like it. <laughs> you've been saved? Why don't you start working out the righteousness of Jesus? So there's a lot of pastors, look, me included, who fail at that. Why? We're, we're humans. We, we're sinful. We mess up. But when we come to the realization, we ought to be convicted by the Holy Spirit and not be satisfied with it. And so Paul's just trying to speak directly to the, the people at Philippi. And he's trying to tell them, live like you know Jesus. <laughs> live like you put other people before yourself, right? That's in chapter two. Live like you, you prefer them over yourself. Live like you have the mind of Christ. Live like you know Jesus. Shine like lights in this world. And that really is what comes to the final word, this, this final word and the challenge is to live with purpose. That if we're really taking responsibility and we are trusting in God, then it will lead us to live a life with purpose. What will be that purpose? That we will represent Jesus to a world who is dying and in great need of him. Now here's the problem, when we get so distracted and we get so full of ourselves, there's no room for the righteousness of God, then what comes out, what we're working out, I'll say it like this, we will always work out what's inside. Uh, another way, I think Jesus said it like this in one of the gospels, that's terrible to say, I should have looked it up. Out of the abundance of the mouth, the heart, I'm sorry, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. 
kind of another way of saying this, you will work out what's inside. You know, you, your, your friends, your family, they will experience your allegiance to whatever you're following. They will know it. They will see it. They know your passions. They know your commitments. So here's the fact, and really the question, is your life purpose Jesus? Is my life purpose Jesus representing him to a world that's in great need of him? Or am I representing someone else or another group? Am I constantly fighting people? Am I wanting to argue more than I'm, more than I'm wanting to be unified with other brothers and sisters? See, the fact is, our working out our salvation is dependent in large part on God working sin out of us. And so we've got to yield to the Holy Spirit. And we fail in our working out when we forget to yield to his working in us. The only way we're going to ever work out our salvation, our sanctification with fear and trembling, it's if we allow him to do the work that he wants to do in our hearts and our lives. So I just want to challenge you today. Let him work. Men, women, boys, girls, let him work. Let him work. Let him do the work in your heart and life. Now, look, if you're here today or maybe you're home, and you're like, I've never, I've never been saved. I, I don't know if I'm a Christian. That's step one. I mean, you gotta do that. I mean, you gotta follow Jesus. You gotta say, I'm giving my life to him. But he will save you. He will save you. But look, it's not about just making a decision and then going back to your regular life. No, then you, then you are working out your salvation. You're constantly walking in saying, you're giving your heart and your life to Jesus every moment. Every, you want everybody to know that you represent him now. See, that's what this Christian life is about. I'm gonna pray for you, but look, if you're here and you need Jesus, you've never been saved, please make that decision. If you're watching at home, you'll have an opportunity to make that decision. Let's do what God is calling us to do. And let's live in confidence in the salvation that he's provided. Lord, we love you. I thank you so much for your word. It's so good. It's so good. We can't read it without just standing in awe of your love for us, your commitment to even give us your grace, even in the midst of our lack of uh, worthiness. God, we, we weren't worthy. Jesus died for people who didn't deserve it. And so, Lord, today I pray you would remind us in that vein of complete dependency. Lord, I pray you'd remind us how much we need you. And then, Lord, that we would just be driven back to our knees in recognition of, uh, of our need of you every day to live the life you've called us to. God, help us yield to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me?